Okay, let's do it again. Welcome to BC 103 New Testament Survey. Today we're going to continue to study on the book of Romans. Uh, Arila, Nina, am I audible? Am I clear? Am I audible? Shriha, thank you. Thank you for confirming. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. So today we're going to continue to look into the book of Romans. So what was our learning from yesterday's class? What did we learn? Anyone from the class can unmute and answer. The online students can unmute and answer, or you can post on the chat. What was our learning? What did we learn yesterday about the book of Romans so that we can study a little bit in detail today? It yes, mainly, it mainly uh, tells about the doctrine of faith, and it's also called as a uh, book of justification. Okay, we studied about the doctrine of faith. Yes, the book of Romans is known to be having a strong doctrine and righteousness. And the book of Romans is also known as the book of justification, it mainly... and it also talks about the righteousness of God. Yes, anyone else would like to add to it? Okay, today uh, in today's class, I thought uh, I thought we look a little bit on the history side about the Book of Romans. Okay, so from the Book of Acts, we learn that the church in Rome had existed for some time; that it was made up of two type of people: one was Jewish and non-Jewish followers of Jesus. But at one point, the Roman Emperor Claudius had expelled all the Jewish people from Rome. So what happened? They all went different places. The Jewish people got scattered. And they went into different places. So about five years later, five years later, the all those Jews, including Jesus' followers, you know, were allowed back to return. When uh, once the Claudius died, the edict that he rele released expired. So the Jews started to return back to Rome. There were Jews who were following Jesus also returned back. So what happened? And when they found a church, had become very non-Jewish in custom and practice. So they created a lot of tension within the church. So that was one of the reasons why Apostle Paul is writing a letter to this church which he has not visited before. Apostle Paul intended to visit Rome, but he has not visited. He's at Corinth and he's writing a letter to the church in Rome. Okay, because there were a lot of division within the church. There were a lot of misunderstanding because they were no more following the Jewish custom or certain the traditions but then they became more of non-jewish in nature non-jewish in the custom so they started you know a lot of commotion way a lot of tension were there within the church so he's trying to address certain issues that's the reason the letter to romans has a lot of doctrines and it is a very stern letter for us to follow as a church because he's addressing to the church which had no unity so there were people who were disagreed about how to follow Jesus. They were debating about uh, whether non-Jewish Christians should celebrate Sabbath, should follow and eat kosher, or should they be circumcised. So there were a lot of 
debate based on these. So Paul wrote this letter to establish few things in the church. He wanted this divided church to become unified and to have certain practical purpose on what they do and what they follow. So he was hoping that the Roman church would become a staging ground or an example to the other church to follow. So his mission or his purpose of writing this letter was for this. So these So these were the certain things that motivated Apostle Paul to write this letter to the Romans and to explain the gospel, explain the good news of Jesus, Jesus' death, his life, death and resurrection. So now the letter is designed into four main movements. We can call it as four main movements. And he's trying to explain the whole gospel under these four main movements. Let me put that in the slide. Let me display that. Just give me a minute, please. OK, I'll be back to the key verse. OK, before we could go here to the main four section, let's talk about the key verse, OK? So the letter, basically, the letter to Romans stands as a clear instruction to the church as an example. So the theme that runs through Paul's letter to the Romans is the revelation of God's righteousness in his plan for salvation, what the Bible calls the gospel. So here in Romans chapter 1 verse 16 and 17, can I request you all to please turn to Romans 16 and 17 please. So those who have turned, can I request you all to please read. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in the righteousness of God is revealed from the faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. As we also discussed yesterday, how powerful these scriptures are. So Paul begins the discussion that which is very important and easily observable by the world. He says the sinfulness of all humanity, that all people have sinned. All people have sinned and have condemned due to a rebellious against God. He also makes it clear that God, by his grace, offers us justification by faith through his son, Jesus Christ. We also see that we, he also explains saying that we are justified by God. We receive redemption or salvation because Christ's blood covers our sins. He also makes it more clear to all the believers. He says God doesn't stop the salvation, but he continues as each of us are sanctified, made holy, and we are set apart to follow him. Paul also shares the logical and the complete presentation of how a person can be saved from penality and, and the power from the sin. That is by believing Jesus Christ. So here he says, human being lacks God's righteousness. So because of our sin nature, because of our sin nature, so we need to receive God. We need Jesus in our life for us to be redeemed. So he says, uh, that's how the whole book, okay, the whole 16th chapter in the book of Romans explains that from chapter 1 to 3, it talks about receive God's righteousness when God 
justifies us by faith. And he further talks from 4 to chapter 5 demonstrate God's righteousness by being transformed from the rebellious to followers. And chapter 6 to 8, he talks about confirm his righteousness when God saves the Jews. And also, uh, and uh, you know, furthermore, in the coming in the other chapters 12 to 16, he talks about the righteousness and the practical ways through our lives. So in this, this is the key verse, Romans 1, 16 to 17, it talks about we should not be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God, power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jews and then to the Greeks. Greeks are none other than Gentiles, for it is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. That is, the just shall live by faith. So here we see the work of the doctrine that has been spread out in chapter 1 to chapter 16. We can discuss this in detail. Yesterday, I just shared about these four points. The main message of the book of Romans. We, we, these are the key phrases. Okay, Righteousness required or righteousness needed in chapter 1, um, verse 18 to chapter 3 of verse 20. Or we can say chapter 1, 2, 3. It talks about, in this section, we see that Apostle Paul applies clearly to both the Jews and the Gentiles, saying that all self-righteousness is inadequate. That means all have sinned and come short to the glory of God. And he also says all are condemned to death. And apart from the same faith that is exhibited by Abraham, that there is no hope. So we need the Savior. We need Jesus. With that, he moves on to explain in chapter 5 to 8, or chapter 5 to verse 7, uh, 8, 39, he says, Let us know that the only hope for man is God himself. The only hope for man to be redeemed, to be reconciled, or to be back to be one with God in the way God created us to be is God himself. So what did God do? John 3, 16. God provided his only begotten son, the man who was righteous to redeem us. So God demonstrated Christ as the only sacrifice. So he sent his only begotten son. And what did Jesus do? He offered himself willingly on the cross to redeem us so that we have the access to God's righteousness, so that we have the access to be one with God by faith through Christ's work. What Jesus did. The work that Jesus did on the cross was to redeem us so that we can be reconciled to be one with God. We can be one with God through the work that Jesus did on the cross. So Paul establishes that faith has always been God's plan, even with the people in the Old Testament. Even if people with the Old Testament like Abraham or David, we all need Jesus to be so that we can be reconciled back to God. With that, Paul goes further and explains from chapter 9 to 11, he talks about righteousness that has been rejected or vindicated. Righteousness that has been rejected or vindicated. So in this session, he, talk, he, he expresses the love of 
Christ. He expresses the love for his own Jewish people and how they were used by God to preserve a seed that's the word of God for the rest of the world. And he also goes further and makes it clear that God only has the true faith through which both the Jews and the Gentiles can come into one understanding. So he says the Jewish branches that rejected Christ were cut off the tree of faith and the Gentiles who received Christ were grafted into the tree of faith. So he brings an analogy here, the tree of faith. Those who believe in Jesus will be grafted into that tree. And those, like even if they were Jewish people and they don't believe Jesus, they will be cut off from the tree of faith. So the way into the tree is through faith, the finished work of Jesus Christ. So the one who believes Jesus is the only son. He was the Messiah. He died on the cross. The one who believes on the finished work of the cross will be grafted into this tree of faith and and yeah, so it can be Jew or Gentile. Whoever believes on Jesus will be included in this tree of faith. So with that, he goes further to chapter 12 to 16. He explains a righteousness practiced or righteousness revealed. He says, Paul goes and says, turns a major doctrine of the Bible into the implication that is, that can be applied. And he also focuses on how things we call faith should affect our life. So he goes further and he focuses on the practical expressions of Christianity by saying what it actually means to display the righteousness of Christ in our relationship with each other in the world. So it is so important for us to you know, love Christ and apply that in our life. The doctrine that we read in the book of Romans should not be just be as a doctrine in the book, but it needs to be applied, practically applied in our life. So some of the very important features that has been discussed in this book is, like yesterday, briefly, we uh, uh, we we spoke about the five features that is justification, propitiation, redemption, sanctification and glorification. So when we talk about justification, it is the process through which God declares us that we are not guilty based on when we accept the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So when we accept the work that Jesus did on the cross, then what happens? that we apply the blood of Jesus over ourselves, over our sin. Because we apply the blood of Jesus over ourselves, our sin has been washed away. And we stand before God just as if we are not sinned. Just as if we are not sinned. So we are justified friend of God. Propitiation is what? Yesterday I explained it to you all. What is that propitiation? Did we talk about the mercy seat? Okay, so Jesus became our propitiation. Jesus became our mercy seat. So it is a process by which God removes the due punishment for our sins. Because of the sprinkling of Christ's blood on the mercy seat on our behalf. Christ became our sacrifice. So propitiation means the mercy seat. Jesus became our mercy seat. The third feature of this book, which, which has been stated in uh, chapter 3 and chapter 8 of the book of Romans is redemption. It talks about redemption. So redemption is a process by which Jesus Christ paid the debt, paid a full price for you and me. So that we are freed from the bondage of sin and death. Jesus has redeemed us from sin and death and he has set us free. 
He has set us free so that we are no more slaves to sin or death, but we are now become the son and daughters of God. So we have got into the sonship of God. We have been redeemed. We have there's a price that has been paid, and we have been redeemed. And now we have the relationship as a sonship with God. The fourth point that the book of Romans talks about in chapter 5 and chapter 15 is about sanctification. It talks about sanctification. So sanctification is a process by which the Holy Spirit of God takes the level of our experience in Christ and it matches to the position in Christ. So this is the practical um, application of the atonement. Where through the blood of Jesus we have been sanctified. We have been purified. We have been cleansed. We have been set apart. So that we can be used the kingdom of God for the master's use. So we are the vessel of honor. We have been set apart for the master's use. So we have been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. There is a position that we have in Christ when we are sanctified. And also further, in Romans chapter 8, the last part, 18, verse 18, 19, and 30, it talks about glorification. It talks about glorification, where again, glorification is a process Glorification is not a process, but it is an act of God. Glorification is not a process, but it is an act of God by which man completes the process of full redemption and his whole spirit, soul and body, where he overcomes the effects of sin and death. So we become one in Christ. When we accept Jesus Christ as a Lord and Savior, we become one in Christ. How? By we believing the finished work of the cross. So we have been, when Christ was glorified and when we are in Christ, we are also glorified in Christ. So in that way, we overcome the effect of sin and death from our life. And also, we can discuss in detail today. Can I request one of you all to read Romans chapter 3, verse 23? Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Yeah, you can read now. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. So it says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So this verse talks about all people on this earth. All people on this earth are sinners. So what happens now? All people on this earth are sinners. And it also says, sin as separates us from God and keeps us from fulfilling our destiny. So one, it talks about that all people on this earth are sinners. And second, it says how sin has the power to separate us from God. It keeps us from fulfilling God's purpose in our life. So each of us have a call, purpose, there's a destiny. So sin keeps us away from fulfilling this destiny. Can I request you all to turn to Romans 6, verse 23. For the wage of sin is death, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you. So we will look at the first part, okay? First part talks about for the wages of sin is death. So it says the wages of sin is death. So what does this mean? It means 
the penalty for sin is death. It also says the death that is referred is in both physical and spiritual. It also talks about eternal death, that is separation from God. That is something that you and I should be concerned about. This sin, the wage of sin, that is the penalty of sin is death. And this death that we talk about is also an eternal death that separates us from God. This is something that we need to be concerned about. So in the book of Romans is where all this has been written so that we can be concerned about our life and get into Christ and believe him that he is the true Messiah. Furthermore, Paul also uh, talks about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows his love for us in that while we are still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes. So what happened? God demonstrates his love, his own love toward us. And in that, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So what does it say? He says, God set his love upon us in spite of a sinful condition. God never waited to encounter us for us to become a righteous. Righteousness is a process until death. So when we were yet sinners, sinners, God encountered us. God came to us. So God loved us in spite of our sinful condition. We also see in this verse that God demonstrate God you know, God demonstrated his great love for us where he provided a plan for the condition. He had a plan. The minute man signed, he had a plan. At the very foundation of the earth itself, God had this plan to offer a son to redeem us unto his own. And through this verse, we also see that God in his holiness could not ignore our sin at the same time. And we also see God had the plan. What was the plan? That God sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to pay a price to die in our place so that you and I can be redeemed back to him. We also see in chapter 6, verse 23, chapter 6, verse 23, the second part, we looked at the first part, for the wages of sin is death. But the second part we see, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what is that? So Christ died on the cross to pay the penalty or pay a price for our sin, so that we can be redeemed. He was sinless, he became a substitute. He was sinless and he took away our sin upon him so that we can be sinless. And also we see what Christ did on the cross. God offers us the free gift of eternal life because our sins have been forgiven now we have this eternal life from eternal death we have got eternal life by believing jesus christ and the work that he did on the cross so in order for us to receive this gift we must accept jesus as the lord and savior and believe in his work that he did on the cross can we also read romans 10 Turn to Romans 10, verse 9, 10, and 13. If you confess with your mouth, 
the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes to righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same law over all is reached to all who call upon him. For whoever, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thank you. So we look into these two verses. We see that Christ died on the cross and he made it possible for us to receive the forgiveness of sin. And the second part we see the gift of salvation is given to those who call on the name of the Lord and accept him as their Lord and Savior. So it is very important for us to believe, confess, and then whoever calls on the name of the Lord and accept him as a Savior, as this free gift of salvation. So the book of Romans tells us about God, of who he is and what he has done. It also tells us that Jesus Christ, he died on the cross and he accomplished the work that God intended it to be to redeem us from our sin nature. And he also tells us about Ourself, what is our condition on this earth? What is our position? So that we may believe in Jesus. We may trust on the work that he did on the cross. And it is through faith that we become one. Paul also brings a point that what God intended at the very beginning, that Jesus will die on the cross and redeem us. Because God loves us. He also demonstrated the love of God to us. So from the very beginning, Paul also uses a lot of Old Testament scriptures here. He illustrates so that we believe the work that Jesus did on the cross. He also says that, you know, Abraham believed and the righteousness was credited to him by faith and not by works. So he also refers to David who, you know, the same truth. Uh, he says in Romans chapter 4, verse 6, verse 6 to 9, he says, Just as David also describes the ble blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So Paul refers David who reiterated the same truth. And he says, Paul uses uh, another example of Adam to explain how the Romans doctrine was inherited sin. And he uses the story of Sarah and Isaac that the child of promise was given. He also goes further and illustrates the principle of Christians being the children that the promise of the divine grace of God was through Jesus Christ. So what are the practical application that we can learn and apply it in our life through the book of Romans? What are some of the practical lessons that we can learn and apply it in our life? So one of the very important application that we learn from the book of Romans is that there is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. We are not saved by our works or any good deeds, but we are saved by believing in Jesus. We need to believe that he was the Messiah. He was the son of God. He died on the cross for you and me. He was the only sacrifice who can, through which we can be redeemed and be reconciled through God. 
Paul also makes it very clear. Every good deed that we do on this earth is like a filthy rag. Nothing can be compared or nothing on this earth that we can do to become righteous. We are only being made righteous through the blood of Jesus. Because he is the righteous one. He is God. He is the son of God. We are redeemed only by the blood of Jesus and not by any of our work. So that's why, uh, you know, he clearly says we need to confess in, in uh, chapter 10, verse 8, 9, and 10, when we read that the word is near you. He says in uh, verse 9, he says, in agreement when we confess with our mouth that Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from death, you and I will be saved. It's only by believing that the righteous, we have been made righteous. So it's very clear that we need to believe, we need to lead, we need to live our life offered to God as a living sacrifice. So we are the set apart vessels. We need to know, we need to lead our life in honor to God. So that is the only way that we can surrender ourselves to God and say, Lord, here I am. We need to worship God with ourselves, with our body, with our mind, with our soul. So we need to worship God as, um, you know, that, that should be our highest desire. So in the book of Romans, we believe that, you know, not we are not saved by our work, but only through Jesus Christ. And we are the set-apart vessel through which we can honor God by ourselves. Is there anything uh, that has ministered to you that you would like to share from the gospel, uh, from the book of Romans? Please go ahead, unmute, and and add to so that we all can learn and grow together. Anyone from the class can unmute and share your views, share your learning from the gospel of from the book of Romans, sorry, from the book of Romans. Anyone? Prabhu, Arila, Karen, Samuel, all the online students, would you like to unmute and share? What was your learning from the book of Romans? Anyone from the class, would you like to share what was your learning from the book of Romans? It's the key verse should be Romans 1.16, that we are not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. So this should be our key take, intake, that we are not ashamed of the gospel. Yes, Sean? Uh, what I learned is that uh, even you don't have to be like a perfect person in order, in order to not to serve, serve God. God. And, uh, and uh, Paul was... Paul was a, a great example, example of that. Uh, he was he used to murder. He used to, used to kill. You know, he's he's not a perfect person. But God chose was him to lead his pe people to preach the word to his, his people. So that's what I liked about this, this book. So he is more a relatable character to us as people. Christ is perfect. That is true. When it comes to us, to myself, I feel uh, we are more we relate more to to Paul. Is what I think. Thank you, thank you, Sean, for adding that. Anyone else would like to add?
Okay, let's close in a word of prayer. If you don't have a question, can I request Rin to pray and close this session? Thank you, Jesus. Lord, um, Lord, we thank you for this time and for this class that we just had um, about your word. And Lord, I pray that uh, whatever we have learned and whatever we have been taught, I pray the Father God that you would help us to apply it into our lives and that um, um, and that your word, Father God, <laughs> would um, activate in us and that um, and that you continue to change us and that um, you want to mold us and shape us, so Father God, to bring glory to your name. And uh, thank you, Jesus, for everything. We give you thanks and we pray that we'd have a great day. We thank you for everything. And we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Amen. Thank you. God bless. See you all in the next class next, next week. <laughs>